While some Western leaders called Milosevic an architect of the conflict, the first shots of the war had been fired by armed separatists in Slovenia and Croatia, strongly supported by Germany. In hope of heading off disaster, the European community organized a constitutional conference in 1991, led by respected British diplomat Lord Peter Carrington, to find a compromise between those who wanted to separate from Yugoslavia and those who wished to keep it together. The problem was that administrative borders, or internal frontiers, devised by Tito in 1943, left one-third of the Serbian population out of Serbia, mostly in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Croatia. These frontiers were drawn in a very secretive and very, in my view, very irresponsible way by Tito's inner cabinet while the war was still going on. And they were never subject to a public debate or discussion. They were never endorsed. The idea of giving each republic substantial economic and political autonomy meant that each was a kind of hierarchy of the party and then there was a you had in order to keep the country together you had to balance out these political leaders and Tito was very skillful in playing one off against the other or in some cases of playing them against their population it was the substitute for democracy in the way that we know it but it was also considered by many of his supporters throughout the population as necessary because to their view democracy led to national or as we call them ethnic parties and that would then break up the country and lead to civil war again. As Yugoslavia slid toward civil war in 1991, two referendums were held on the same day in Croatia. Croatians voted overwhelmingly to separate from Yugoslavia, while ethnic Serbs, particularly those from the Krajina region, voted by a similar margin to remain within Yugoslavia. A compromise favored by European community negotiators would have permitted Croatia to leave the Yugoslav Federation, but would have permitted the regions where Serbs formed a majority to remain in Yugoslavia or to gain substantial autonomy. Serbs who lived in an independent Croatia would be guaranteed full citizenship and human rights protections. In the capital city of Zagreb, Croatian President Tuđman seemed reluctantly prepared to accept this compromise, which would have prevented a major military conflict. Germany, however, announced they would recognize both Slovenia and Croatia within Tito's administrative borders before the end of 1991. There would be no compromise. The Serbs were bitter that the first act of a newly united Germany would be to divide the Serbs of Yugoslavia into at least three separate countries. A crucial opportunity to divide Yugoslavia by peaceful means was now threatened by Germany's action. It broke up the constitutional conference because once you gave two out of the six republics their independence, those two had no further interest in the constitutional conference. You had to ask the other republics whether they wanted their independence which meant you had to ask Bosnia, and it was perfectly plain uh, that Bosnia, that, well, there was going to be a civil war in Bosnia if you did do that. UN Secretary General Perez de Cuellar sent a strong letter to German leaders warning that recognition would be a disaster. Germany and Austria's own ambassadors in Belgrade privately warned against recognition of Croatia. The Germans risked being isolated, but the pressure from the, from the Coles party and from the huge lobby of the um, uh, Croat lobby in the southern parts of Germany, and Bavaria particularly, was such that it was difficult for Genscher to go on uh, postponing uh, the support. By the time the war started, the German public had already been prepared by the repeated attacks on the Serbs in an influential German newspaper in Frankfurt. The strident commentary of Johann Georg Reismüller which favored Croatia and reviled the Serbs, any Serbs, all Serbs, reminded Peter Hanke of the way Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels once characterized the Jewish race. It was the German press in the form par excellence of the right-wing Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and its journalists that fundamentally influenced German policy. German support for Croatian separatists received an unusual tribute, a musical thank you on Croatian state television. 
Danke Deutschland, meine Seele brennt. Danke Deutschland für das liebe Schein. Serbian television broadcast Croatia's musical thank you, interspersed with World War II footage of cheering Croatian crowds in Zagreb, welcoming Hitler's troops. All sides use propaganda, but Serbian propaganda was aimed at the Serbian population to bolster Milosevic's power base. By contrast, Croatian propaganda was designed to win international support. With the help of public relations firm Ruder and Finn, Croatia successfully used the media to manipulate a larger audience, particularly Germany and the US, to gain support for its separatist agenda. This was particularly evident in the reporting of the war around the resort town of Dubrovnik, a favorite vacation spot for German tourists. Working through its Washington PR firm, the Croatian government managed to convince much of the world that Dubrovnik was being destroyed by the Serbs in unprovoked attacks which lasted for months during the fall of 1991. The public has been led to believe that the uh, Federal Army attack on Dubrovnik was not precipitated by anything but sheer malice. However, on August 25th of 1991, Croatian forces attacked a base uh, in the Bay of Kotor, on the Bay of Kotor, and they were repulsed with heavy losses. Yugoslav troops based in Montenegro then fought their way up the coast, confronting Croatian forces near Dubrovnik. Targets outside the old city were hit, uh, consisting mostly of hotels, which had been uh, uh, taken over as barracks and spotter points by Croatian forces, who also put refugees in the lower stories of their own barracks and spotter facilities. It was obvious that the Croats were using the old town as a defensive wall. They were firing from behind hospitals. They had a mortar position next to our hotel. The final straw for me was when there was this incredible bombardment in our hotel basement. Bang, 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 bang. The worst we had ever heard. And I was furious, and everyone else was panicking. And I said to the manager who was down there with us, I said, I wish you would tell that chap with the heavy machine gun in the floor above to stop firing at the Serbs, because they're going to fire back. Contrary to news reports, there was little damage to the historic old city. Yes, it has been reported to, uh, some 15,000 shells rained on the old city of Dubrovnik. I counted 15 mortar hits on the main street. The Yugoslav Federal Army could have destroyed the old city of Dubrovnik in two hours. It is not destroyed. Washington Post reporter Peter Maas, who visited the old city several months after the fighting stopped, found Dubrovnik in what he described as nearly pristine condition. There are many people who go to these uh, scenes of uh, mayhem and adventure who don't know where they are, who don't know the languages, cannot really communicate with the people, and who take press handouts from the local authorities. So there is certainly a, an orchestrated effort on the part of the Croatian and uh, the Slovenian, Austrian, and German media to portray the Serbs as a bunch of howling Byzantine, uncivilized barbarians. The facts on the ground, however, mattered little after first impressions had been made. Rather than admit that they had made a mistake, influential columnists on both sides of the Atlantic continued to write that Dubrovnik had been destroyed. Public opinion was tilted against the Serbs and towards Croatia's political goal, recognition as an independent state. These impressions helped strengthen Germany's resolve to lead a reluctant European community to recognize